of the lands in the Canberra region where we have the privilege to work and to live. And I pay my deep respects to their elders past and present. Uh, so it's my pleasure, my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Ruth Morgan. Uh, Ruth is the Director of the Centre for Environmental History here at ANU. She's an environmental historian who focuses on Australia and the broader region. Um, she's published extensively on water and climate histories of Australia, the British Empire, and the broader Indian Ocean region. And among other things, uh, Ruth was a lead author on the latest report of the IPCC. Way too many achievements to list off here, so uh, instead I'll simply hand you over to Ruth and let her tell you about today's topic, which is rising seas, rising islands, climate diplomacy at the end of the Cold War. Wonderful. Okay, thank you very much, Rob. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to come over to this side of the creek, which um, doesn't happen enough. Um, and of course, thank you, Rob and Beth Pierce, I believe, dropped me in. So um, I'll thank her, although I believe on um, the long service leave or OSP, something convenient like that. Um, so I'd also like to um, acknowledge and pay my respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples um, uh, on whose unceded lands uh, we live and work and of course, pay my respects um, and acknowledge that this land has never been ceded. So as you might have gathered, um, now, sorry about the quirky fonts that um, have emerged here. What I'm focusing on today are really the role of islands, two islands in particular, in the emergence of climate change on the international political and scientific agendas in the late 1980s. And I suppose we're very familiar now with islands being at the forefront of these discussions, pushing, I suppose, um, the international community towards uh, more ambitious, I, I suppose we could say, um, negotiations and agreements. Um, and they are acknowledged in the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. They're, they're really, um, I suppose, the leading moral force reminding negotiators of what's really at stake um, when we talk about climate change. But that wasn't necessarily um, always going to be that way when we look back at how these issues emerged in the 1980s. When we think about who has the resources to do the scientific research, who has uh, the historical responsibility, it's not the islands. So why are these guys the ones that are fronting up to the United Nations General Assembly in the late 1980s and saying to the international community, something must be done? And we're focusing on Malta and the Maldives, not randomly. They, they are the two islands uh, that, that have that um, special billing in the General Assembly in 1987 and 1988. And I want to find out, well, I want to explore with you why it's those two islands that take centre stage. And I want to argue that it's not only because of their concern about rising sea levels. I mean, that's what we tend to think when we're thinking about islands and climate change. It's more than that. It's a political uh, story as well about the role of the Commonwealth, um, probably um, a, a body of nations that we only think about generally um, when it comes to the Commonwealth Games, but they, they were a more active force in the 1980s. The role of the non-aligned movement, the role of ideas about development and vulnerability, um, as well as the concern about escalating natural disasters during this time. And finally, the influence of the negotiations around the, um, a protocol and a convention for um, the hole in the ozone layer. So let's go back to 1988, when this gentleman, David Attard, writes to the Times, the London Times. He says, Prime Minister Brundtland of Norway's distressing statement that the impact of world climate change may be more drastic for mankind than any other challenge except for nuclear war, not only reflects a tremendous foresight, but also demonstrates the need for a comprehensive global strategy to protect the weather and climate as part of an effort to ensure that our planet Earth remains fit to sustain human life. Now, he's not just anybody, he's the legal advisor to Malta's prime minister at the time. And he, he continues in his letter to say, may I use your distinguished newspaper to suggest that the first phase of this global strategy would be a UN resolution declaring the weather and climate to be part of the common heritage of mankind and that the appropriate mechanism be established to protect these natural resources. And so just four months later, we have the UN General Assembly recognising Malta's case 
that climate change is indeed a common concern for humankind and urging governments to collaborate to protect the global climate. And this leads us on the path towards the UN Framework Convention that comes along in 1992. Now, as you might have gathered from Adad's letter, the spectre of nuclear war remained even in 1988 with its attendant threat of nuclear winter leaving no corner of the globe unscathed. And the planetary extent of the environmental effects of nuclear war was among Brundtland's Our Common Future report, which she described in terms as phenomena emerging on a global scale, such as ozone depletion and, of course, climate change. But this report, and it emerged from you know, several years of consultations, existing political institutions weren't really up to the job of dealing with this scale of global problem, problems that uh, had uh, very diverse sources, cross boundaries and so forth, and really demonstrated the, the degree of economic and ecological interdependence between nations. Now, although the multilateral management of global commons, such as Antarctica, the ocean and outer space, all offered models for the kind of global strategy that Attard um, was looking for. It was really negotiations of the Vienna Convention um, of 1985 and the Montreal Protocol in 1987 that became the template for what was emerging around a climate regime. There was still a lot of discussion about what would that look like. And these forms of atmospheric diplomacy shared a focus on scientific consensus, close collaboration between scientists and policymakers, and a reliance on scientific expertise to render visible the object of their concerns through these sorts of um, graphics, a, a really visual language of trying to show um, lay people just what the problem was and, and why it mattered. There was also the problem of acting in the face of scientific uncertainty uh, with the increasingly influential precautionary principle offering grounds for governments to act in anticipation of environmental harm because these, these photographs or images of the um, hole in the ozone layer were really only found in 1985. So it was just as well that they'd started um, developing a, a convention because if they hadn't, well, we wouldn't be on, as on top of it as we might be today. So as our common future put it, if they wait until significant climate change is demonstrated, it may be too late for any countermeasures to be effective against the inertia by um, that was already stored in this massive heat system, they said. As you have probably gathered though, addressing these kinds of challenges, um, we're going to face these problems that we're very familiar with of national sovereignty and economic development. These are problems or challenges, hurdles, I guess, to negotiations that had been around since at least 1972 at the UN Conference on the Human Environment, when we'd seen these issues of development of different national interests coming, um, butting heads really, when we saw the majority world of the South encountering the interests of the industrialized, industrialized countries of the North. And although proponents of sustainable development tried to reconcile these differences, negotiating questions of historical responsibility, equity and compensation continue to be very difficult diplomatic terrain. Now, I'm certainly not the first. Um, plenty of people have, uh, now, where's my little slide gone? Have written about these challenges, um, but not necessarily centering the role of island nations. Um, we're very familiar with the, the rise of um, the Alliance of Small Island States after um, the 1990 World, Second World Climate Conference, but not the prehistory. And that's what I hope to um, examine today. So the Commonwealth, this is, this is their time to shine. Of course, they're actually more preoccupied with um, apartheid in South Africa, um, amongst other uh, issues of international political concern, particularly economic development. Um, but we're focusing on uh, this gentleman, the Maldives president, President Gayoum, and um, we'll shortly meet the Commonwealth um, Secretary General, Sonny Ramphal, but only in a minute. So David Attard, the Maltese um, legal advisor who wrote the letter to the Times, 
when he when he was writing, he was serving as a legal observer of a group of experts that were preparing this report for the Commonwealth Secretariat. That report was headed up by the UK scientist Martin Holgate, who was the Director General of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources. He's also, also a former UK chief scientist. And they had come together after this meeting in Vancouver in October 1987, one of those wonderful Chogham um, meetings. And it was there that the president of the Maldives, this gentleman, who presented his uh, concerns about sea level rise and its predicted impacts on low-lying areas of the world, such as his own atoll nation in the Indian Ocean. Just that year, so early 1987, he said, there had been unprecedented tidal swells that had wreaked havoc on his archipelago, particularly the densely populated capital island um, of Mali. The ocean's assault, he called it, had washed away recently reclaimed lands, inundated their croplands, damaged physical infrastructure and ruined beaches, which were the source of their very young tourist industry. Is this the beginning of sea level rise consequent upon global warming? He reportedly asked. And he, it was at this meeting that he called for such an investigation to be undertaken. Now, the Maldives was a relatively new member um, of the Commonwealth. They'd only become a full member in um, 1985, shortly after the commencement of um, Sonny Rantvall's third term. And he too was well aware of the growing international interest in the effects of climate change because he had served on Prime Minister Brundtland's um, report, um, Our Common Future, which was the, uh, the report of the World Commission of Environment and Development. And he said himself in early 1987 that I initially took the theory of global warming and climatic change with a proverbial pinch of salt, but none who has had an opportunity to study the latest statement of consensus on this matter arising from the major gathering of scientists at Villach, Austria in 1985, and to have questioned some of those doing scientific work can fail to acknowledge that the composition of the atmosphere is something that humanity is tampering with at its peril. And the report, Our Common Future, warned that global warming could cause sea level rises over the next 45 years large enough to inundate many low-lying coastal cities and river deltas. No mention of islands. We'll come to that in a minute. And uh, so we have Ramphal commenting there um, about the influence of the um, Brundtland report. And the influence of this report from Villach in 1985 on um, Brundtland's um, work. And the Villach meeting in October 1985, as some of you might know, was really, well, as the new scientists put it, the week the climate changed. Back when scientists from 29 countries met under the auspices of the WMO's World Climate Program to undertake a scientific assessment of the climatic impacts of increasing atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. So this was a meeting where they were trying to elevate an issue that had really just been something that scientists had um, contemplated, um, looked into, weren't entirely sure whether they all agreed on the ins and outs, but this was a moment where they could agree at the end of that um, week in October that they had an international scientific consensus, the first one, on the role of increased carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. And they said it's now believed that in the first half of the next century, a rise in global mean temperature could occur, which is greater than any in man's history. So a very significant meeting. And recent findings underscored their message. Researchers at the University of East Anglia had observed for the Northern Hemisphere that the cooling trend of the 1940s to 60s had ended and that a warming trend was well underway. In the United States, the National Academy of Sciences Changing Climate Report uh, looked into the trend of rising sea levels during the last 100 years, which could continue due to the warming effects of melting glaciers and the possible disintegration of the West Antarctic ice sheet. And that had been something that had been speculated since the late 1970s, um, uh, put on the table by Gordon MacDonald as, as something that was you know, worth being concerned about, particularly for coastal cities, um, places like Florida and so on. And Louisiana, I think, were two um, 
places that the US was particularly concerned about. And the US and its EPA uh, research suggested that seas could rise as much as one metre within the next century. And although the scientists at Villac in 1985 had looked at the implications of those findings for coastal zones, island nations weren't really part of the mix. But the unique circumstances of those places wasn't lost on the Commonwealth Secretariat. Because since the late 1970s, at least, the Commonwealth had been providing a great deal of technical and financial support to its members that belonged to a category of states that were being characterised not only by their disadvantage, but by their smallness. So size mattered. And it was a particular disadvantage um, of developing island countries, as they were called um, back then, which had been on the UN's radar since at least the early 1970s and had been flagged as part of the new international economic orders agenda in 1974 when their um, developing countries are calling on, um, uh, I suppose, the industrialised nations to, to give them a break. We need some structural economic reform. At the heart of the problem for small island nations was the smallness issue, as well as their remoteness from world markets and their particular exposure to natural disasters. So they needed special assistance, according to the United Nations. Now, the Commonwealth, with a growing number of these newly independent small island states, was very attuned to, the, to their special needs. Um, and it wasn't just because of the membership um, side, of, side of the equation. Secretary General Sonny Ramphol, um, who was from Guyana, was well aware of the um, structural problems affecting um, developing countries. And he'd really shifted the agenda of the organisation to be a vehicle for the new international economic order. He was advocating for um, a, a more just <laughs> international um, market situation. And the Maldives president, Gayoum himself, appealed directly to those sentiments at a regional Commonwealth meeting in 1982. He said, by joining the Commonwealth, we hope to benefit from the full range of Commonwealth services and facilities, and more particularly from participating in Commonwealth programs of financial cooperation. What really elevated the island situation for the Commonwealth was the invasion of Grenada, a Commonwealth um, member since its independence in 1974. And it really highlighted to the um, heads of government their vulnerability of such small island states. And at the heads of government meeting in New Delhi in 1983, shortly after the invasion, members agreed to an urgent study on the challenges um, that faced small island states, not only in terms of their economic development, but also in terms of their national security. And so we have this report coming out in 1985, which also included a consideration of their vulnerability to natural disasters, uh, particularly, as its authors said, um, hurricanes and typhoons, where they felt that the catastrophic effects of these events are such that we felt it right to include them within the general category of serious threats to economic security. Oops. The UN uh, was also alive to these concerns, um, including having formed the UN Office of the Disaster Relief Coordinator in um, the late 1970s. And in preparation uh, for meetings in the early 1980s, a British consultant was dispatched to prepare a report on the economic and social effects of natural disasters on the least uh, developed and developing island countries. And three of the five countries he looked into belonged to the Commonwealth, Antigua and, Bar and Barbuda, Samoa and the Maldives. And this was all happening in the, in the early 80s when he was preparing this report. And he too highlighted the effects of tropical cyclones on island nations in the Pacific and the Caribbean, most of which were also Commonwealth members. And so this is where we see this um, changing idea around disaster starting to emerge. That this wasn't just um, a sort of fate or the hand of God, that these had 
a dimension of vulnerability to them, that some countries were more vulnerable, some groups in those countries were more vulnerable to the effects of um, disasters, and that they had a socioeconomic uh, dimension to them. And these conversations around vulnerability were also being drawn into critiques of development, um, the, the shortcomings, I suppose, of the international focus on modernization and development in which the United Nations, of course, had been very invested for decades. So there was a growing awareness that disasters were not so natural after all, and that um, they had a historical um, and social uh, aspect to, to consider. We start to see a greater focus on coastal areas when um, scientists and policymakers come together again to um, in Villac, no less, in 1987, as well as in Bellagio um, uh, later that year in November. And they're trying to build on the, uh, not only the consensus that they'd established in 1985, but also the momentum of the ozone negotiations. They're starting to talk during these meetings about the possibility of a law of the atmosphere, that, that they could wrap up um, ozone um, issues and climate into one um, singular law of the atmosphere, or potentially a convention that would uh, complement and, and sort of follow the same kind of process that had been developed for the ozone layer. And their subsequent report, which you can see bits of up here, noted that half of humanity inhabits coastal regions, which they noted were already under great pressure due to accelerating population growth, pollution, flooding problems, and upland water diversion. With rising sea levels and a greater inland penetration of storm surges, they anticipated that many flood disasters would, um, with large losses of life, property and farmland would affect the Delta regions of South Asia. So we're getting a little bit closer to the Maldives with these sorts of reports. But in the intervening period, so there's about three or four weeks between um, these meetings, President Gayoum has the opportunity to address the United Nations General Assembly. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't find a photo of him doing that, but we'll make do with these. So he addresses the um, gathered representatives um, just days after he'd been at the Commonwealth, the heads of government meeting in Vancouver. The reason the UN General Assembly was meeting was for the presentation of our common future, the Brundtland Report. And his address followed immediately after hers, and I don't think that was an accident. The Maldives president emphasised that a sea level rise of two metres would represent the death of a nation. Even with a mere one metre rise, he said, a storm surge would be catastrophic for the low-lying archipelago. So you, not only was he describing here um, damage that they'd encountered earlier in the year, which he'd also mentioned um, in Vancouver, he wanted to point out the country's unique qualities, which had recently been showcased by Tor Heyerdahl, who um, had I suppose a global following at the time, um, thanks to his Contiki uh, reconstructing Pacific Polynesian voyages um, in um, sort of period boats. It was it was a thing, um, and he was uh, very well known, I believe. And he'd um, been to the Maldives himself and um, written this bestseller, and he described. Uh, the Maldives as green jade necklaces, scattered emerald jewellery placed on blue velvet. And this is what um, Gayoum cited in his address. It's now a distressing probability that the environmental change caused by industrial progress in the developed world may slowly drown this unique paradise in its entirety. The country's ecosystems alone, by virtue of their uniqueness and vulnerability, deserve protection. So the Maldives is drawing on that language of um, the new international economic order, referring to questions of historical responsibility for climate change, really drawing out this question of, of justice and, and compensation, um, which have now, um, I suppose, come to dominate our discussions of climate change. And the Maldives is a member of the non-aligned movement um, and manages to very strategically balance its um, foreign affairs during this period, and we'll get to that in, in a moment. 
But the other aspect that I want to draw out here with his stance, his sort of third world position, um, as it would have been understood then, was that similar conversations had begun to enter the ozone negotiations. Now, in contrast to the climate negotiations that would follow, the ozone negotiations were a bit of a closed shot between developed countries at this time. And it's only towards the end of the 1980s that negotiations are opened up to the developing world. And they realize that they have come to the party a little bit late and that they are going to get the short straw as a result, that these agreements around how to limit um, the production of CFCs might have implications for their economic development. So countries like India and China, which were leading the, um, the third world then, probably now too, um, were um, very vocal about um, how these negotiations um, had been conducted and what it meant for developing countries. Gayou mentions these issues again later in 1987 when he goes to the Kathmandu meeting of the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation, where, as you might imagine, with countries like India and Bangladesh and Pakistan, all members of the non-aligned movement, um, that they were very concerned about sea level rise. So there was a sympathetic audience for these messages. And he was also supported by Bangladesh, both at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Vancouver and in Kathmandu, Kathmandu pardon me, because like the Maldives, they too had experienced devastating flooding in 1987, which a local analyst deemed the most disastrous calamity in the past 70 years, and there had been many. Um, of course, there were even worse ones the following year. Now, the question of coastal um, vulnerability had been partly brought into the meetings in Villac and Bellagio thanks to a Dutch engineer associated with the Delft Hydraulics Laboratory. And at the laboratory, they had funding from the UN Environment Programme to compare the potential impact of sea level rise, not only on the Netherlands, but on Bangladesh, where modelers anticipated it would have a considerable impact, and the Maldives, which they described as a region of perhaps restricted worldwide interest but where tremendous social, cultural and environmental impacts are to be expected. They pointed out that there wasn't a whole lot of data to measure sea level rise in South Asia, among any, many other parts of the world, and the global sea level observing system, so this is before satellite um, measurements um, come into the picture, that was only established in 1985 and the Maldives only got their first two tidal gauges in 1987. So they're working on uh, pretty sketchy data. I just wanted to include some of their modeling in there. So the other thing that's happening in 1987 when um, President Gayum of the Maldives is doing his tour, um, it seems, that the UN Environment Program's Regional Seas Program uh, forms its task teams on the implications of climatic changes for each of its six regions. The ones relevant to us today are the Mediterranean region report and of course the Maldives report. Now they're both published in 1989, but they've been underway since 1987. And the UN Regional Seas Program um, emerges really focusing on the Mediterranean. Um, and the reason for that is a concern about the um, impact of pollution, oil spills in particular, very concerning. Um, and they're um, setting this up in the mid 1970s uh, with the Barcelona Convention in 1976. And Malta is at centre stage in these um, processes. And Malta is really um, set up to be the, the monitor for the Mediterranean to check whether there's any pollution going on, to um, sound the alarm, those sorts of um, responsibilities. And this was all part of a wider uh, Maltese foreign policy effort to champion the notion of Mediterranean peace um, and their non-alignment, which they wanted to, um, I suppose, focus on in the late 1980s. And so Malta, having sort of grappled with its independence um, and, and where it stood in the world, um, was now moving away from being a prisoner of its geography to now making that geography its 
primary advantage within the international community. So if we go back to Canada the next year, when um, countries around the world gather, uh, not countries, I should say, um, in independent representatives or researchers and legal uh, thinkers gather in Toronto for the Changing Atmosphere Conference, which um, was where we start to see um, ideas around reducing carbon dioxide carbon dioxide emissions by 20% of 1988 levels, these sorts of um, uh, thresholds that we're now familiar with today. This was a conference very much coming out of the Brundtland Report. Um, she was there, she was involved. It, it was kind of a product of that process. But the Commonwealth's there as well, um, probably not surprisingly because it's held in Canada. But so Peter Marshall, um, who was the economics director for the Secretariat, um, had been involved in those meetings at Villac and Bellagio, and he brings a Commonwealth perspective to this meeting as well. And so they're very much focusing on how to encourage more international cooperation on this meeting. And this is also around the time that James Hansen and his colleagues in um, the US are presenting their concerns um, to Congress and saying something is going on here. Um, the world is warming and we need some action. So all of these events are coming together. And it's not long after that Toronto meeting that David Attard of Malta is writing to the Times of London and suggesting that the UN General Assembly ought to be involved. Shortly before the first plenary session of the IPCC in November 1988, Malta's representative to the UN introduces a draft resolution that would have a direct bearing on the scope of its activities. And we have uh, the foreign minister, he's also the president at some point, but I couldn't find another photo of him, putting forward his government's case for the conservation of climate as part of the common heritage of humankind. And he nods in this speech to Malta's leading role in getting the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea off the ground back in the 1960s, which has only just been finalised in 1982. So this is an incredibly long period of negotiations that Malta's representative had kicked off back then. And so he's arguing that it's essential that action be taken on a global level. All countries, the whole um, membership of the General Assembly needs to be involved. He too is calling, um, is, is foreshadowing, I suppose, the role of small island nations in his um, address. He's talking about Malta's smallness quite explicitly in his discussion. But again, it doesn't quite bring us to why Malta. Why Malta is the one that follows the Maldives in the General Assembly. Well, in an interview with the Times of Malta in 2018, David Attard says that it was sheer coincidence that he ended up being able to sit next to the head of the UN Environment Program, Mustafa Tolba, on a long flight from New York to Amsterdam. And he uh, recalls that he was able to convince Tolba of the need for the UN General Assembly to be involved. Um, Tolba would have happily, because he'd come out of the ozone negotiations with a lot of um, uh, uh, authority, because he had guided those negotiations, that in fact it shouldn't be um, the responsibility of the UN Environment Program. It should be something that the UN General Assembly should lead. Um, and so that's Attard's recent uh, recollection, uh, centering himself, of course, in that story. But 10 years earlier, um, Malta's climate change ambassador pointed out that it may be useful to recall that the end of the Cold War brought with it the need for Malta to ascertain its identity both as a neutral state and in its bid to join the European Union. Previous bilateral arrangements with countries like Libya had led to its isolation from the same political and economic group of states it was now seeking to be part of. And there were similar concerns for the Maldives. Since opening up the island to tourism in the 1970s, Guyum had been the first um, Maldives representative to the UN in 1977, part of a shift away from what had been a very inward looking approach to its foreign policy. And there were very familiar third world themes in, in, its, um, in the islands. 
uh, outlook. Um, and they had also been, though, embroiled um, in something of a bit of a international scandal when the Soviet Union looked very carefully um, and made an offer to the Maldives to uh, rent or lease, I should say, the former British airbase on the island of Gan. And while the Maldives would have liked the cash, uh, they decided that that would not be a good idea, not least because the US base of Diego Garcia is very close. So this was why it was a real strategic um, uh, problem if the Soviet Union was going to move into GAN and really escalate tensions in the Indian Ocean. So two local observers in the early 1980s described the Maldives as typifying the Machiavellian prince because it had succeeded so far in eliciting developmental support from all sides while retaining an independence of sort in actions which belie its size. So Heidel has seen this himself when he um, was writing his book, attending the inauguration of the president's second term. He said, never except at the UN have I seen such a gathering of diplomats from all around the world, all trying to curry favour with, um, with this country. So after Malta puts um, climate change as a common concern for humankind on the General Assembly's agenda, the Maldives also um, continues its leadership um, we have the Small States Conference on Sea Level Rise held in Mali, where um, its uh, declaration finds its way to the Secretary General. And these um, declarations, along with many others, like those held in uh, The Hague, um, other parts of Europe, um, sort of filter their way through into the negotiations of the Framework Convention. And here we have... Um, uh, an interview also with um, Gayum about the role of the Maldives and how um, he doesn't want to see environmental refugees. Then uh, shortly afterwards, we have the non-aligned movement's uh, influence, I think, in the rise of the Alliance of the Small Island States at the Second World Climate Conference in 1990. We have uh, Malta um, uh, executive secretary of the negotiations um, for the uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change. So continuing um, influence, I, I suppose, in these early years of climate change um, negotiations that aren't strictly environmental, aren't strictly scientific. They are about the geopolitics, about um, the concerns around development and particular island nations trying to advocate for themselves in this really um, changing um world that they find themselves in and trying to make the most of um, which way the winds are blowing. So thank you. I'll wrap it up there. <laughs> hmm. Perspective. Yeah. So throw it open for uh, questions. Oh, so, so just, just wait. So long. Oh. Oh, I, I will, but I'm not sure that's stuck in properly. Oh, <laughs> I suppose when I saw your title, I thought, I oh, know she's going to be talking about Pacific uh, Kiribati or something. And so I guess my question is, what happened to Malta and the Maldives? Why did they, if Wait. they were, yeah, well, why, why did, given their initial influence, mm. what's, what happened next that made them somehow recede and some Pacific nations seemingly take on this a similar mantle of, you know, using their geography mm. to try and create bigger change. Yeah, well, I think um, the Pacific story is perhaps a bit more regional during the 1980s where Australia is um, uh, understandably concerned for them as, as well as themselves and, and fund um, a tidal gauge network in the Pacific. But I think part of the issue for the Maldives in particular is uh, the fact that President Gayoom is not exactly the most democratic of leaders. And so... It's not a very good look for um, the uh, climate change negotiations to be, I suppose, uh, platforming this gentleman. Um, and the his successor, um, who, who did the underwater um, uh, climate change uh, statement, I think in 2010, he was imprisoned 
you know, in, in the 90s. So um, by Guy Yoon. So bad guy, not a good guy at all. Um, and Malta is very much focused on the European Union during this time. And, and because it's part of the European Union, um, doesn't get that uh, individual country representation. It's part of the bloc. So hence we see more from the Caribbean and more from the Pacific, I think. Um, not to say that there's not problems with um, some of the governments um, there, but I think they, they really step up um, during this period. And they also um, seem to have the influence of um, or the support of very savvy legal negotiators during the negotiations that elevate um, some of their uh, delegations in the negotiations. More questions? I've got one if it's okay. Please. Um, I'm just wondering, early on, this is my memory, um, the emphasis seemed to be on rising sea levels. Mm. You know, and the low, uh, the islands and the low-lying countries like Bangladesh and what have you are really mm. concerned about rising sea levels. Can you work out in your perspective when people started thinking about the broader implications that climate was actually going to change? Seasons would change, you know, rainy seasons would be at different times, mm. all the devastation to ecosystems, warming waters, wrecking fisheries, all that type of thing. Do you know when that sort of crept in and people started thinking more about that? Yeah, I think it's when... Um... Oh, I'm going to say the 90s. I think in the 80s and 70s, you still had a sense um, of some countries thinking that they might benefit, mm -hmm. that, that there could be winners here, particularly um, countries like uh, the Soviet Union. Um, and they thought this was going to be a great... Yeah, that's right. Through. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> understandably, uh, looking for, for silver linings. But I um, can't pinpoint the specific moment, but I think it's when they can actually start to see um, evidence of warming temperatures mm. that they start to notice changes and, and start to be able to um, see improvements in attribution science as well. Um, so a lot of the discussions were kind of around the realms of possibility. Yeah. Um, but yes, the, the the fact that seasons would change, which would then have issues for food production in particular, seemed to be a really um, big concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, was, I suspect the farming communities were, were, were the first to sort of, yeah. or amongst the first to point that out. And the concerns around then famine. That's right, yeah. Environmental refugees. Exactly. Um, big, big worry, particularly countries like Bangladesh in particular. No, it's fascinating. More questions? Just following on that, um, following on from that, were the environmental refugees concept present from the beginning, or is that something that came later? No, present from the beginning. Um, Crispin Tickle, who was one of wonderful name, but one of Margaret Thatcher's <laughs> advisors. Um, he's a, he's a, he was a big uh, 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 promoter. Is not the right word, but he he was trying to sound the alarm during the nineteen um, eighties to the Europeans and to, to Britain about um, climate change. And one of the, I suppose, boogeymen that he raised was we're going to have environmental refugees. Um, so be worried about your borders. Um, this is why we need to do something because a lot of people from developing countries will be trying to, to get to safer ground. So that kind of security slash humanitarian angle has been there for a long time. And the true the nice thing seriously, because that's funny, man. <laughs> <laughs> true Brit. <laughs> More questions? Did you go to lots of awesome places to do this study? <laughs> <laughs> so no, I wish, I wish. No, and then when I was uh, the the very exotic locations on the IPCC itiner itinerary were also thwarted by COVID, so there was the prospect of Guatemala on the horizon, but alas. No, no. Since we got onto the yes. topic of how you did this study, I'm, I'm fantastic presentation. It's a textbook I don't have to read or a chapter at least. So thanks very much. Uh, I'm just interested in your academic practice. Yeah. How? How did you arrive at this particular narrative? Do you do you start at the beginning and move forward? Do you start at the end and move backwards? Do you follow leads? I mean, <laughs> clearly read widely, but I'm just sort of more interested how you arrived at this particular narrative, mm. these reports and these images. Thanks. Um, so for me, I suppose I was really 
interested in why these two islands and so I think for I you know in my other work I, I looked into some of these um, issues of how climate change kind of became international why why was it at the UN General Assembly um, but these particular islands I knew nothing about um, and it made I couldn't understand why you know the major narratives we have are you know the United States uh, takes the lead well the United States isn't in this picture at all really um, so it's a process of a lot of um, kind of reading backwards reading scientific papers or, or um, uh, almost you know legal conventions and then finding out well who's championing these yeah where do they come from um, and then why at that moment what's going on in that area at that time um, I mean you're always looking for the smoking gun like you know, I want someone to say in a newspaper article that, oh, yeah, I said this to this person, but um, we have to sort of make do with um, trying to say, well, you know, there's an awful lot of things happening in that region that make it likely that certain um, uh, certain issues were were taking hold. Um, but I think the, the interest in me is also looking for particular people emerging um, and what... I suppose the ethics or the trouble I find um, personally doing some of this research is that I don't want to undermine the, the legitimacy of, of what's going on in terms of the scientific research and the negotiations, but they don't unfold the way they do by accident. Um, certain groupings form for certain reasons. Um, you know, in Australia and the US are close cousins in the negotiations not only because of the ANZUS alliance, that kind of thing. So looking for those deeper um, foundations, I suppose, of why the negotiations look the way they do. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was going to ask the same question that Jeff did. Oh. Uh, but, so I'll, I'll, I'll change tack. Think on the spot, Max. <laughs> I'll, I'll change tack slightly. Um, so the... The choice of Maldives and Malta, uh, one thing that's always struck me in the, the whole debate about vulnerability versus adaptation mm. is it's the, the nations of the global south mm. that seem to be most vulnerable, that have come out on top, at least in terms of the development of cogent, practical national adaptation mm. strategies. Bangladesh in particular, um, not sure about Maldives, but um, some, some like Cape Verde is another mm -hmm. example. Yeah. Um, Colombia, South Africa. Had you noticed this pattern emerging in your research that, that this this link between vulnerability and the need to get serious about adaptation that is so lacking mm. in the global north? I think um, I think part of the issue is one of exposure to hazard mm -hmm. and that they those governments um have understood um the threats associated with climate change as part of a, a wider uh suite of vulnerabilities mm -hmm. to whether it's typhoons or hurricanes and so it's part of their general planning rather than put in the special climate change yeah, box. Yeah. yeah right and i think for um the uh, challenge for uh, industrialised nations um, like Australia, like the US, has been a sense of invincibility, much like yeah. a, in COVID we saw, where many developing countries actually seem to handle um, some of the public health um, issues a lot better. Um, whereas because developed countries seem to think they're invincible, um, climate change has been put in a different box mm. um and adaptation was very slow to arrive on the international agenda partly because developed countries didn't see any benefit in it for themselves mm. they saw mitigation as something that everyone would benefit from but adaptation was something for the developing countries to be worried about mm. and they saw that as well that's just more development aid um that we don't want to pay um so i think those sorts of outlooks around um your, their history of exposure to risk um, plays a role there. Yeah. Yeah, I think 
There's something there. Yeah. 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 That's an interesting uh, a sort of adjunct to the narrative that adaptation was taboo because yeah. adaptation, if we start talking about adaptation, we detract from the, the kind of justification for mitigation. Yes, How do you see those two stuff. things playing mm -hmm. into each other? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the other um, aspect that put adaptation off the agenda was that countries like Saudi Arabia, we might have been in this group as well, wanted to kind of twist adaptation into, well, how do we adapt our economy to not using, not uh, being reliant on fossil fuels? Yeah, interesting. And so um, by taking adaptation off the table entirely, negotiations could circumvent those um, less than, um, yeah, less than kosher yeah. um, approaches. But certainly um, there was the... The sense that well if you talk about adaptation we're throwing in the towel um it's being manipulated or well, we don't want to pay for the adaptation we're not going to get anything out of it any more questions well, i think the timing's pretty good so um thank you again that was a very stimulating talk <laughs>